Okay. We can start. Uh, just a brief reminder for all of you guys to check out the upper floor. So if you haven't been on any uh, lectures up on Utrecht, uh, uh, make sure you, you check that out too. There is also a chill zone over there where you can sit down, have some calls and other things uh, uh, with, uh, uh, yeah, with your daily uh, uh, job and everything else that, that you're bringing here with you. Next up is Nicholas. Nicholas, the floor is yours. Good luck. Thanks a lot. Dobar dan, Hipcon. The rest of the, like, SERP that I know is, well, it shouldn't be recorded, so let's keep it at that. So thanks to be here for this talk about chopping the monolith. I have 30 minutes, so I will skip you who I am, how awesome I am. If you're interested, Google me. If you are not, nobody cares anyway. Um, I do this talk also in the US, so um, I have a disclaimer because, you know, in the US, you should be very careful about hurting other people's beliefs. Uh, here I am in Serbia, probably it's not an issue. You are used to that, that's fine. Um, I go to a lot of conferences, I read a lot of content, and at the moment, there is this like trend that if you're doing a monolith, it's bad. And because of that, you are a bad developer. Whereas if you do microservices, it's good. And because of that, you are a good developer. Um, I believe it's crap. Who, is, who here is doing microservices? Hey, come on, raise your hands. Uh, there is light. OK. OK. Good. I hope that I will convince you that you are the bad ones. So you probably know what microservices are. I let you read, blah, 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 co decoupled, all that bullshit, right? The thing is, if we really check what it is, we can see a couple of characteristics. And it's not me, it's Martin Fuller. So if you like, don't believe me, at least trust Martin. And in general, when I have time, I ask people, hey, who is doing microservices? OK, you also have the room. Componentization, who is doing that? Yeah, everybody does. I mean, that's the basics. Organized, blah, blah, blah. And then I go to the end, and I go there. Product, not projects. So basically, everybody who has an end date for their microservices is not doing microservices. Now, according to this definition, who is doing microservices? Hey, come on. Okay, one hand, two hands. Okay, three hands, four. That's a bit different from the beginning, right? So that's good. You are good developers. You are not doing microservices. And at the beginning of this like microservices craziness, people were very, very careful to say, look, you need to invert Conway's law. So Conway's law is to say that if you want to have a specific architecture, your organization needs to be designed the exact same way. At the beginning of the microservices talks, everybody told it. Now nobody does. So it means that, well, if you have a layered architecture, it's probably because you are organized around layers. And if you want microservices, you need to be like your organization, need to be organized around teams. Again, small question, who is organized like this? Uh, a bit more of, no, uh, a bit more than with the no end, which is already cool. But again, much lower than everybody says hey, at the beginning, microservices. And Amazon Web Services actually does it. They like invented the idea of those two pizzas team. It's vague enough so we can have big pizza, small team mem I mean, that's not important, but well, it's a limited number. And the, the important bit is they are self-sufficient. They are autonomous. They are self-organized. They can work without any dependency from an organizational point of view. And so I asked, who is, oh, who's organization is like this? I saw a couple of hands. The thing is, in this organization, like in this organization, here and here and here, 
there's probably a manager. And when I say probably, it means there is a manager, right? Here, where is the manager? Upis di materinum. And that's the ID. The ID is that if you have a traditional organization with managers and you want to migrate to a like, self-organized organization-based team, then what are you doing with the managers? So for who will raise their hand? You, for example, you are in front, sorry, they are in the back. What did you do with your manager? So basically, he's a secretary, right? He's taking care of everything that nobody wants to do. No, no, no but not working on that, but like... Uh, he's a problem solver. He removes the, bound, the blockers. Exactly. Okay, that's fine. My experience is that it's very hard for a like, legacy organization to move from like these managers-led organization to such an organization. So you start with such an agile organization, or it's very hard. Because the people who can migrate are the middle managers. And of course, they would be crazy to like remove their own jobs. Another problem that I see with microservices is, hey, you are a tech person, you are an architect, and guess what? Microservices are super popular. So you want to put it on your resume. So what do you do on your next project to implement microservices? And then you realize that uh, it's not going as it was planned because, of course, it's very complex, not only from a technical point of view, but from an organizational point of view. So before like, being flushed with like, the, the projects, you run away. And who is going to take care of the mess? Well, not you. All the other person who followed you in this project but at least you have it on your resume. So that's also a very common way to do stuff. But why are microservices so popular? There are, like, there are many, well, there are a couple of benefits and a lot of problems. So nobody talks about the problems anymore. I mean, it's problem solved. We are a transaction, where we have Saga. Well, <laughs> have you ever tried to implement Saga yourself? It's a mess. It's a real mess. But let's focus on why we are doing microservices, why the benefits. So again, Martin Fuller, not me, he talks about three main benefits. He talks about the strong module boundaries, independent deployments, and technology diversity. So let's check each of them to understand if it's really necessary to do microservices to have strong module boundaries, for example. Well, that's completely crap. Yes, if you do microservices, you will have strong module binaries, but you can have strong module binaries without doing microservices. Like, for example, you can think about Java, I don't know if it's Java Conference, Java 9 modules. Now there is this uh, new project in Spring called uh, Spring Modulith. I mean, you can have rules, like architecture rules with ArcUnit or whatever, that enforce the fact that this package does depend on this package and not on this package. You can prevent circular dependencies. And then, well, you have a nicely designed monolith. So you, you will have strong module boundaries if you do microservices, but you can do without. And it's, a, again, it's a lot of complexity, it's additional costs that I don't want to bear. Technology diversity, well, everybody wants their own tech stack, right? What's your tech stack? Front-end, Front so what's your tech stack? JavaScript. JavaScript, I prefer Kotlin. So if I come to your project, I will sneak it Kotlin, I will transpile it to JavaScript, you will see nothing and I will be happy because I hate JavaScript and I love Kotlin. Let's do it, right? Well, it's technology diversity, right? Who doesn't love diversity? And everybody has the same problems. Everybody wants to have their own like tech stack, 
even it can be an individual tech stack, it can be the team tech stack among the whole organization, it only works for the people who are doing this. You are actually, if you bring your own tech stack to an, an organization who has another, you, you will actually increase the problems. You, you won't solve anything. Like bringing a new tech stack into an organization is a real project in its own right. So you are making yourself happy and like making everybody else unhappy. So it doesn't work. So what's the reason for microservices? Well, let's talk about the lean time. So perhaps you, you heard the term lead time. So basically, this is like the phases of a project. First, you specify, then you implement, then you deploy. Well, specification, in general, it's not up to us. And it's incompressible because we cannot do anything about it. But implementation and deployment is our responsibility, especially if we are doing DevOps, whatever that means, and this is the late time. So basically, implementation time and deployment time is the lead time. The idea is to make it as short as possible, so to deploy multiple times a day. And perhaps you have noticed that I have gray hair, that I'm quite a bit older than most of you. Um, so we already had this issue before. It's not a new problem. We want to deploy, to like develop and deploy as fast as possible. But back in the day, we couldn't do it because we were using the monolith, you know, the really big, bad mon monolith. And when your monolith starts to get a bit bigger, you cannot test everything. So each new release, you test, it takes time. So you actually have a project that really is focused on just the fact that you need to test and deploy. So we had release trains. Who knows about release trains? One, two, wow. I'm really that old. Oh, three, thanks. So basically, you only released like four, three, four times a year. And it was the, ho the whole organization was focused on these release trains. The problem, because you had like this scheduled that you couldn't release at any other time. So basically, if you missed the train, you needed to wait until the next wagon. And the next wagon was in three months. And the business wasn't happy. But of course, there was exception. Like, if it was a bug fix, a real problematic bug fix, you could deploy. So what happened? <laughs> <laughs> you shipped anyway. And you had a lot of, of, of bugs, of course, but nobody cared. Because, well, that was the point. And then you couldn't continue to deploy like crazy. Uh, you got to love organizations, right? Normally in the introduction, I say that I've stopped doing projects because actually I had like to solve like organizational problems with technical solutions. Well, that's one of them. But that's what we did back in the days. You, we had these organizational constraints. We, we, we manage it anyway. But it means that the idea to deploy, to implement and deploy frequently was still there. The problem is that it's not possible to do that with Monolith because, well, it takes a long time to test. Now, to be honest, it's also not possible with microservices. The people would tell you, hey, look, we only test what we ship and everything will be fine because we have strong contracts. Well, hey, let's be serious, folks. But anyway, that's the current story, so let's continue that. But the real problem is not shipping the whole application. The real problem is shipping the ports that you change. And I have experience, so perhaps you have the same, that if you stay a couple of months, a couple of years on the same project, you will notice that some parts of the code change regularly or completely arbitrarily while some other are pretty stable and don't change that often, if at all. Not all parts of the project change at the same space, at the same pace, sorry. And so if you are used to the project, you can identify it. It only comes with experience with the project. There are a couple of reasons for that. In general, it's the business that requires the changes. And again, they are always asking on A, like they change it and it and again and again, or there is a law and you need to change it. 
And back in the days, again, I'm playing the old guy, um, we had the same problem and we solved it in a completely different way. We had those rules engine. Who knows about rules engine? Ah, good. Who used the rules engine already? Sorry for you. <laughs> no, I'm saying that because, well, the idea behind the rules engine is that you actually let everything in the hands of the business. So basically, it's not your problem anymore. They basically have a formula, and they can directly edit it in production. You are not involved anymore. Well, the only time that I was like close to such a project, I asked the architect, hey, can you, I check the rule? What, what did you write? So basically, it was impossible for a business person to like change the formula. It was really impossible if you are not a developer. And then if you were just a regular developer with no clue about the business, well, it was impossible as well. So basically, the idea that, hey, the business is completely independent of IT, they don't need deployment, it's just crap, then in, in this case, it wouldn't be a deployment, it would be, hey, you call the IT guy and you say, hey, you can you change the formula to do this? The guy would do it. That was just the, the only difference. So you, you would still be dependent on IT, it's just that you, you wouldn't go through a regular deployment phase which means also you wouldn't test it at all. Huh? You would do just do the change in production because, well, YOLO. Anyway, so that was a great idea, but again, organizational problems and stuff, not that great. But there are multiple alternatives. So microservices is one of them. You can also do serverless. You can do rules engine. You can do whatever you want. That's not the thing. But the idea that microservices is the only way to like, solve the problem is just a very, very wrong conclusion. I don't know if you have read this book by uh, uh, Richardson, and basically, in this, it talks about the strangling the monolith. So the book is really dedicated to microservices, and I think it's a really great book if you want to do microservices. And again, I would advise you against that. Um, but it tells about the, 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 the migration path from a monolith to, um, to a set of microservices. So you start with a monolith, and of, you can chop some parts, and then you chop more parts and more parts and more parts until, well, there is no more monolith. There is just a set of microservices. That's if you want your state to be, to be like this. And my question is, why would you? Because if those microservices here and here and here are stable and you don't need to deploy them that often, you don't care. So perhaps in your application, in your context, well, this is the to-be state. This is the, the, the stable ports that don't change often. And those are the, stable, the unstable ports that change often or like randomly. And again, you, it needs to be counted for. Make sense to you? Good. And now comes the part where I'm saying, hey, you just do that and everything will be good. Because, well, I'm a developer advocate and you know I'm saying that use my stuff and I will solve all your problems. Now, in this case, I'm just telling you here, if you have an API getaway in front of your application, and I believe you have an API getaway or at least a reverse proxy, then, well, you can keep the monolith, just chop the port, but for the end user, and when I say end user, it might be your mobile app or whatever, it can be completely independent. It's a facade that will isolate your changes here from here. So in that case, it could be a strategy. I have worked in e-commerce and I really like it because it's like very complex, but then Everybody understands it very easily. So imagine that you have an e-commerce application and the business wants to promote some product because the business always wants to do some stuff that, well, is our reason to live, but it's always a problem for us. So it can be, it can be too much stock, it can be leftovers from the last season, it can be you life high margin on this product, high revenue, I don't care. It's always, always changing. So in most like ready-made e-commerce platform, you have like the pricing engine is crazy. You have lots and lots of rules that you need to configure. 
every time there is something that the business wants that is not part of the ready-made rules. That's just the rule of life. So you have this platform, but it doesn't account for everything. So the pricing should be really, really flexible. And well, the idea is you don't want to break the client. So perhaps you can use an API gateway for that. Uh, sorry, it's demo time. So I've talked a lot. So you might not believe me. So I want to show you how you can implement it with a very, very simple demo. So here I've created an application and here that's fun. Now I need to change it every time. It's an e-commerce application. So how it works, and you see, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing some development. It's very simple. OK, I can put stuff in my cart. Amazing. I can go to checkout. And then I have the price that is computed here. If I refresh, you can see that the, so it's XHR. And the response is here. And it's very, very small. I'm sorry, I can, ah, I can make it bigger. That's amazing. And you see that it's from the monolith, right? Here. Can remove stuff, that's not the important bit. How does it work? Well, uh, I, if the, the, the code is in Kotlin, I told you I really love Kotlin. Um, but it, no, it's you. You are the, the one doing JavaScript. Yeah, sorry, I missed you. But anyway, so I still like Kotlin a lot. And here, this is the checkout. So basically, just before checkout, when I want to display the page, I will like do the checkout view. I will get the checkout view. So basically, what I'm doing, I will get all the lines, and I will get the original price. So how do I get it? I call this function called price. So I've, I've got my cart, and I call this stupid function called price. And basically, here, this is the basic stuff. I just add no promotions, no whatever. But the idea is I want this to be very, very flexible, because again, it might change like at the customer's will. OK, so first thing first, this, I want to make it a route. I want to expose it. I want um, to be able to be uh, using the API gateway afterwards. So I, what I'm doing is instead, I will, oh, here, git, I make pricing the HTTP route. So now I, I have kept the function. But I have a dedicated route for that. So the client will first ask for the card, will get the card, and will send it to ask, hey, give me the price of this. No, I don't want to install it in the middle of the demo. It's a really bad idea. Um, now I need to remember how does it work. Docker compose app. And it's called, uh, I don't remember, chop shop. Sorry. Oh, you are using the dash. You are still using the dash. Now that thanks for your help, but in this case, I'm, uh, it's, I'm, I'm actually using the normal stuff, the up to date stuff. Sorry, sorry, the up to date stuff, and uh, you don't use the dash anymore. Now you don't have a separate Docker Compose install. You have a regular Docker, and then this Compose stuff. But you know. That's really good, because you learned something today. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So thanks for your feedback. But actually, no, that's, uh, I'm doing the correct stuff in that case. No, I just want, it's a GVM, so of course it takes a long, long time. Yes, sure. And now <clears throat> I can get back to my shop. Normally, it takes a bit of time. You see that I have updated the version, right? Now it's 1.3. And now I will put stuff in my cord, blah, blah, blah. And if I go on the card page, now I have two calls. So the first call, as I mentioned, first it gets the items from my card, and then I send the items from my card to the pricing service. Then it returns me the price itself, and we can still check that it's still the monolith. 
But now I have my API gateway in front. So here, every time, everything I'm doing is through the API gateway. You can see the, like, I, I, I wouldn't dare call it architecture. Here I have Apache API 6, the API gateway that I'm working on. API 6 stores everything into etcd for its configuration. So etcd is the distributed key value store, the same one used by Kubernetes. Then I have my application. And then I have my database. So nothing mind-blowing. It's really like standard stuff. The only thing that I'm going through is every time I'm using the, um, sorry, the, the API gateway port. So I go through the API gateway. And now amazing stuff. What I'm doing is I will keep the deployment as it is. So I will keep the code. I will keep everything. What I'm doing. I will just change how it works. So here, I will create a new route called price that I already add. But before, it went to the monolith. Now I'm like chopping it. I'm saying, hey, if you see price, you will call here. It's a serverless Azure function. You can use anything. It could be an honor microservice, whatever. So I run this configuration. So the good thing with Apache API 6 is that you can uh, like um, configure it through an API call itself. So that's what I did here. And now, if I refresh, so I didn't deploy anything. I just configured the API gateway. It takes a bit of time, of course. That's thanks Azure function. Yes, here. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. So, and that's the, the gist of it. So basically, I kept the deployment. I didn't deploy anything like on my infrastructure. I just had deployed these, the same stuff that I had before. I can show you the code. It's here. Of course. I had to rewrite it in your like preferred language because I couldn't use Kotlin. I could have, but well, I'm super lazy. Um, and, and well, it's, it's the same. And this I deployed on Azure. So here I just copy pasted the stuff and it works. So lesson is that I didn't deploy anything and I'm still like agile enough to deploy as fast as I want. The only requirement in that case is that I need to know to identify which parts of the code I need to deploy like frequently. I believe that's good. Well, thanks for your attention. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter. You can, I was perhaps a bit fast with the code because 30 minutes is not long. So uh, you can check on GitHub. Everything is on GitHub. So I didn't uh, bullshit you. Um, Sorry. I didn't fool you. Sorry, you can cut that at, at the end. Um, if you are interested about the blog post, I've written the blog posts. And uh, again, I had no time to talk about Apache API 6, but if you're interested, you are welcome to check the project. It's an Apache project, so it's really like not only open source, like we will change the license anytime we, uh, anytime we want. It's a real open source project handled uh, by the Apache Foundation, so it's like company free. And now I manage it ni nicely, I believe. I have like five minutes. No, I have one minute and 30 seconds to have questions. Who has questions? I'm afraid when I have no question. Can mean it was the best talk ever, and well, there is no question, or it was the worst talk ever, and well, you don't want to shame me publicly, which I really appreciate. But if I could have one question, I could like believe it was in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Good. Less good. <clears throat> the problem. Wait, 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 wait. OK, you have a monolith, and it's two, it consumes two gig of memory. So what? No, OK, but what problems do you have? I would 
Uh, okay, it consumes two gigs of memory. So you have a monolith that consumes two gigs of memory. Did you measure the time that the clients are like taking to go to the monolith and back? Uh, Over time, do you have peaks? Do you have, if you are using the GVM, do you have like stop the world's problems? You know, it's Java. <laughs> yeah, that was my question. But like the more recent garbage collectors, they don't, free, they don't stop the world. So the problem is not that it's consuming two gigs. The problem is what consequence of the consumption of two gigs it has. If it has no problem, why do you care? You are creating yourself problems. And I'm done. Yeah, cool. Sorry. Thanks a lot. I will be there today. So if you have got more questions, please come to me. I have stickers. I have lapel pins. Enjoy. And voila.